Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the fifth talk in the lecture series organized by the Department of English, Gokhale Memorial Girls College. Uh, the topic for today's talk is the tradition of political autobiography in Indian lit literature. It will be delivered by Dr. Shyam Chattopadhyay. He is associate professor of English in the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at the Indian, Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur. He received his doctorate degree from the University of Cambridge in 2014. He was the recipient of the 2010-2013 Smuts Cambridge International Scholarship and was the Baden-Württemberg Visiting Fellow at the South Asia Institute of the University of Heidelberg in 2017. His research has been primarily in the area of Indian middle class self-fashioning and its literary manifestations. Um, some of his recent publications include the book publication being in English, Indian Middle Class, and the Desire for Anglicization, published by Routledge. Um, some of his journal articles are From Indianness to Englishness, The Foreign Selves of Michael Modushudan Dot, uh, Nirod C. Choudhury, and Salahuddin Chamchawala, uh, published by the Journal of Commonwealth Literature, Disowning Indianness, Images of Indian Womanhood, and the English Self of Cornelia Sorabji, uh, published by Pro Studies, History, Theory, Criticism, Routledge, Homeward Journey Abroad, Niradsi Choudhury, and the Tradition of 20th Century Indian National Autobiographies, um, published by Sage, Things of Stylized Beauty, the Novels of Shudhin N. Ghosh, and the Fragments of an Indian Tradition, Ariel, published by the University of Calgary, Reconstructing the History of Exile and Return, a reading of Dom Morris's The Long Strider, published by the Journal of Postcolonial Writing, Routledge. Uh, he has also co-authored the papers, Walking the Indian Streets, Analyzing Ved Mehta's Memoirs of Return, uh, Routledge, um, Passage Through India, Self-Fashioning in Santa Ramarao's Indian Travel Narratives, Routledge again, and um, Dalit Middle Class and the Crisis of Colonial Modernity, a study of Ajay uh, Navaria's Yes Sir, co-authored uh, with Diksha Beniwal, uh, and it is published from Sage. Um, some of his book chapters include Return as a Stranger, Tom Morris and the Ambiguity of Homecoming. Uh, this has been published uh, by Rodopoi and um, of ex white men, whiteness, and nationalist self fashioning in Rabindranath Tagore's Gora and Niro Choudhury's autobiography of an unknown Indian, um, published in the book Images of Whiteness, um, and is published by Oxford in 2010. Uh, welcome to the lecture, sir. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Durba, for uh, the introduction. Now, because I uh, don't know what kind of audience is listening to me, I'm just assuming that there uh, would be some students there too, because this paper is primarily um, an attempt to converse with them. Uh, and I was told that a section from Nero Chaudhuri's autobiography of an unknown Indian was part of uh, their syllabus. Uh, and since I've now spent a uh, significant amount of my academic life grappling with the writings of this extremely controversial intellectual, uh, I decided that it might be a good idea to share some of my thoughts on his autobiographical writings uh, with uh, the students. However, uh, I would like to begin my discussion uh, not with Chaudhuri directly, but with unpacking the genre of uh, political autobiography within the context of Indian literature. This is because, uh, as I would argue during the course of my presentation, Chaudhuri's autobiographical writings manipulate in unique ways the narrative grammar of this literary category that I am referring to as political autobiography. And therefore, any understanding of uh, the works of Nira Chaudhuri uh, would need 
an understanding of how political autobiography operates as a literary genre. Now, the history of uh, political autobiography in India can be uh, traced back to the early 20th century when we can see a profusion of autobiographies uh, produced by eminent Indians like Shurendranath Banerjee, M.K. Gandhi, Jawaharlal Nehru, Abul Kalam Azad, and so on. Now, in all these narratives written by politicians engaged in the anti-colonial struggle, the personal life histories provide the template for inscribing the history of the contemporary nationalist movement. These narratives, uh, which I will be referring to as political autobiographies, as I just mentioned, are characterized by a fusing together of the project of individual self-fashioning and the political project of fashioning the destiny of an emerging nation. In them, the articulation of self-identity of the protagonist therefore merges with the fate of the nation as a whole, which is why this genre has also been referred to as national autobiography. So uh, throughout my presentation, I would be using uh, the terms political autobiography and national autobiography interchangeably, and I hope that won't be too confusing for you. Now, <coughs> sorry, if we try and unpack this genre of political autobiography, uh, we will see that these narratives at their core are underlined by a singular trajectory of exile and homecoming. And the two spatial points between which this circuitous journey of exile and return and homecoming takes place are England and India. To understand this better, let us take uh, the life writings uh, of Gandhi and Nehru, which are, uh, in fact, two of the most iconic political autobiographies produced in India, right? And I'm sure that uh, most of you will be familiar with their outlines, even if you have not gone through those texts extensively. So if you look at these two autobiographical narratives, you will see that uh, they describe both Gandhi and Nehru journeying to England as students and they are spending a substantial part of their formative years there. Uh, there are obviously differences in the ways in which each of them uh, experiences the colonial metropolis, but in both their autobiographies, their stays in England are depicted as marked by false pursuits and extravagant wastefulness. So there's distinctly a very negative note associated with the space of England. On the other hand, their return from England to India, which uh, in case of Gandhi happens via South Africa, is depicted as a journey to a more purposeful life, a life identified with the unfolding of contemporary national history. Now, within the broader context of Indian uh, post-colonial history, the Indian history of, let's say, the 19th and 20th century, the spatial dimension that underpins the journey of exile and homecoming in the autobiographies of individuals like Gandhi and Nehru evokes deeper resonances. Indeed, the journey that they trace between India and England is found to be in many ways the paradigmatic modern Indian journey between the native village and the colonial city writ at large. Uh, this journey has been the subject of a number of films, of uh, television shows, of novels, and as I describe this journey, even you will be able to relate uh, this journey with a number of texts that you might have read or you might have seen uh, in these various media. Such journeys to the colonial city began in the subcontinent during the 19th century, when cities in India came to be defined primarily as centers of colonial political economy, 
rather than as important sites of pilgrimage. So the character of city, what constitutes a city, uh, changes within the Indian context, let's say during the 19th century. You'll understand this better if you compare, for instance, how uh, a city of Varanasi performs today and how a city like Calcutta uh, performs. Calcutta was a colonial city. It uh, was not a site of pilgrimage. It was primarily a site of colonial political economy and colonial administration. Whereas a city like uh, Banaras, for instance, which was a pre-colonial city, which I mean still continues today, remains a site of pilgrimage primarily, apart from other economic factors. Ashish Nondi makes an interesting observation in this regard. According to him, a journey to the city from the village signifies in India, and I quote, a journey from a self buffeted by primordial passions and an authoritarian conscience, and the village is seen as a repository of these things, to a self identified with fully autonomous ego function. So, in simpler words, the journey from the village to the city is regarded by Ashish Nundi as a journey towards individualism. Right? However, the city, in spite of assuring a fully autonomous Ego has also been seen in India since at least uh, the 19th century as a place of moral and even physical degeneration. Hence, the journey to the colonial cities within India, like the journey to the colonial metropolis, becomes a journey into the wilderness of exile. Now, um, this you can very well understand if you read simultaneously uh, Gandhi's autobiography and uh, his Hind Swaraj. For instance, in Hind Swaraj, he says that the cities are sites of moral corruption and even physical diseases, primarily because they are westernized spaces. And he asks Indians who are living in the cities to go back and start living in the villages. If you read Gandhi's autobiography, you will see that he makes a similar kind of argument while describing England. Uh, England too, just like the colonial city in India, for someone like Gandhi, was a space of moral corruption and moral degeneration. And also, it posed a number of problems, physical problems, in terms of living, as far as Gandhi was concerned. Uh, and this same negative sentiment is associated in almost all of the national autobiographies that you can think of. Uh, Nehru, you read and you'll also see that the same kind of negative association is there associated with the colonial metropolis and with the city. A uh, journey to the, uh, uh, consequently, this kind of negative association with the city, colonial city, and with the colonial metropolis uh, gives rise within India to the desire of making a return journey home, which is which as an antithetical space to the impersonal and anonymous city gets associated with a utopic village of imagination. Now, uh, popular representations of this uh, still persist today. Think of uh, films made by Shah Rukh Khan, Swadesh, Dilwale Dulhaniya Le Jayenge, all of that. A journey to the village is thus a nostalgic return journey from a city of atomized individualism to a pastoral home that is imagined as a prototype of Indian civilization. The journey of Nero Chaudhuri's life, narrated in his several autobiographical works, uniquely transforms these trajectories of exile and homecoming that underline Indian political autobiographies or national autobiographies. Firstly, unlike most national autobiographies, Chaudhary's life writings depict a journey that begins from India and ends on the shores of England. Secondly, they do not trace the nostalgic journey from the city to the village but rather narrate a journey from a very small country town located in the far-flung colonial periphery of East Bengal to the center of the British Empire. Thirdly, far from being a journey towards Indian civilization, Chaudhary's autobiographical journey is unabashedly motivated by his desire to, uh, he says, rescue his English self or Anglicized self from the corrupting influence of India. 
and its hoi polloi, general janta. However, in spite of this singular curve of Chaudhary's journey underlying his autobiographies, which uh, might uh, make him look like a maverick individual whose works do not fall under any category, I would argue that his life trajectory nevertheless conforms to the same pattern of exile and homecoming that frame most other national autobiographies. I would suggest that this is achieved by Chaudhary through radically redefining such constructs like what is home and what is exile and by geographically realigning these poles of the journey. So how does he do it? To answer this question, let's uh, start by briefly looking at the life and life writing of Niro Chodhuri. Now, uh, Niro Chodhuri or Niro C. Chodhuri, Niro Chandra Chodhuri was born in 1897 in a small town called Kishor Ganj, which is in East Bengal. Now, what is uh, called Bangladesh. After graduating as a student of history from the University of Calcutta, Chaudhary went on to take up a series of jobs that ranged from being a clerk in the accounting department of the Indian Army to being a staff in the news division of All India Radio in Delhi. His fairly inconspicuous existence till the first five decades of his life, however, took a sharp turn when a few months before India attained independence, Chaudhary was seized by the fear that, and I quote, all our lives lived till yesterday were going to disappear without a trace. A desire to preserve this past, these lives lived till yesterday, which was about to disappear with the end of the British colonial rule in India, Chaudhary clearly wanted to preserve this preserve this past. And this desire ultimately led him to write the autobiography of an unknown Indian, which was published in 1951. Now, autobiography brought Chaudhary to the attention of an international readership. This was not exactly his first book, but this was the book which first gained him an international readership. But it was also a book which, in his own country, made him one of the most reviled literary figures. Chaudhary's desire for anglicization and his claim that, uh, quote, all that was good and living within us was made and shaped by the British rule, earned him the tag of being an anti-Indian author. And that tag, as uh, we all know, has persisted till this day, which is why I called him a highly controversial figure. Ironically, however, this anti-Indian reputation of Chaudhary is in marked contrast to the ways he conflate the, uh, in which he conflates the images of India with the articulation of his anglicized self throughout his various autobiographical writings. For instance, in the very autobiography of an unknown Indian, which cemented his reputation as a traitorous Anglophile, we find Chaudhary claiming, and I quote, I have only to look within myself and contemplate my life to discover India. I can say without the least suggestion of arrogance, land Samoa, India, that is me. This close intertwining of the personal with the national reveals that Chaudhary's autobiographies are integrally associated with the tradition of political or national autobiographies. However, as I have already mentioned, Chaudhary's use of this typical trope of the national autobiography is complicated by his attempt to significantly modify the structure of this genre by reworking the underlying trajectory, the underlying journey. And it is to this reworking that we will now turn. To begin with, it is important to note that at a very superficial level, Chaudhary's autobiographies do present his journey from the village to the city through the conventional trope of the archetypal journey from home to exile. What is important is that this is revealed through a superficial reading. Thus, Chaudhary begins his autobiography of an unknown Indian with a description of Kishor Ganj, the little country town in which he was born. Kishor Ganj marks an ambiguous space in Chaudhary's writings where the urban is shown to be precariously located at the edge of the rural while constantly tending to merge and disappear within it. 
However, in spite of this fragility of the urban setting of Kishorganj, Choudhury asserts that every child growing up in Kishorganj, and I quote, had a sense of the city and citizenship in a very specialized form. This sense of urbanity was reaffirmed with every visit to his ancestral village of Bonogram. To Choudhury as a child, Bonogram presented an absolute contrast to the spirit of the city life that characterized Kishorganj. One of the major differences was that life in Kishorganj was governed by the disciplinary clock time, whereas life at Bonogram was not. This disciplinary clock time was essentially the urban time of colonial cities introduced by the government to optimize the labor input in running its bureaucratic machinery. The disciplinary time also controlled the lives of the urban students like you, uh, enrolled in the new Western educational institutes as well as Western educated professionals like journalists, lawyers, and teachers. Uh, you'll understand this uh, well. For instance, if you think of the routine that you need to follow every day, you need to attend, uh, let's say, the class of Durba Mukherjee every Saturday or every Monday at 10.45, and you need to be there, and she needs to be there, and it all functions like clockwork. Thus, Chaudhuri remembers the Tishorganj of his childhood as marked by, and I quote, a routine of steady, unremitting, and regular work for everybody all around the year, except during the two yearly vacations. In contrast to this urbanized daily routine of hard work, Chaudhuri portrays the ancestral village, which he regularly visited as a child during his vacations, as a place of uninterrupted leisure. As Chaudhuri recalls, in the kind of feudal landowning family to which he belonged, Work was essentially the domain of, to quote him, serfs, who gave us domestic service as a matter of hereditary obligation. The family members, at least the males, are thus described in autobiography as spending their time lounging in the hut, especially decorated to serve the purpose of a retiring room. So whenever they were at Bonogram, this was how they would spend their time. And I quote, this was the place for every lazy fellow, the hut, which was designed as a retiring room. And everybody was lazy. There was always a bunch of sprawlers throughout the morning. And the most assiduous were my brother and I. Apart from this laborless existence, which was unperturbed by any regimentation of clock time, there was another thing that distinguished Bonogram from Kishore Ganj. This was the difference in interpersonal relationship that framed the life in these two places. In the ancestral village, there was no purely social relationship, and everyone with whom one could socialize with belonged to the family, right? So there was nothing like uh, colleagues or friends or things like that. In contrast, the urban life of Kishore Ganj was completely devoid of such extended family ties. And Chaudhuri explains that what brought the people together was not a common bloodline, but a sense of loyalty to the city and the idea of a shared citizenship. This is Kishore Ganj. However, in spite of this bond of citizenship that Chaudhuri felt at Kishore Ganj, he states that an essential part of growing up there was to learn that it was not his home, but only a place of temporary residence. Following the grown-ups, the children too had to carefully bear in mind the different answers to the questions, where do you lodge and where do you live? The distinction was important because the words lodge and live were connected to two very different Bangla words, evoking not only different spatial but also emotional resonances. So in Bangla, the act of living or being at home somewhere is associated with the word body. This is opposed to the Bangla noun basha, which is generally translated as lodge and conveys, as Chaudhuri puts it, the suggestion of temporary lodging. So bari and basha. In other words, one never lives in a lodge or basha, but merely uses it as a sojourner. Chaudhuri recollects that in his childhood, he had, a diligently, he had to diligently learn how to answer the questions about living and lodging separately, even when conversing in English. 
and I quote, in our English lessons and attempts at English conversation, we replied Bonogram when asked, where do you live? And Kishore Ganj only when the question was put in the form, where do you lodge? Where do you temporarily stay? According to Chaudhuri, this consciously cultivated feeling of living away from one's true village home got even more accentuated when he finally moved from the semi-urban space of Kishorganj to the city of Calcutta and stayed there continuously from 1910 to 1942. When he first went there as a student, Chaudhuri writes that he observed the same sense of a missing but ever-present ancestral home in the village informing the consciousness of all the resident students who had come to Calcutta from outside. He describes the institution of the messes or boarding houses where students like him would stay. These messes or boarding houses were typically basha or lodges where one resided only temporarily. But even this temporary residence bore the unmistakable stamp of the more permanent provincial homes of the students. Thus, as Chaudhary writes, the messes could be regarded as little colonies in Calcutta of the different districts of East Bengal, right? So one would assume that there would be a mess where people from in and around Bonogram will come and stay together and so on and so forth. In the Calcutta section of autobiography, Chaudhuri narrates how during this period, uh, which is spent in Calcutta, he became dependent upon urban sanitation and urban amenities, but could not get completely reconciled to city life. Hence, in spite of staying there for more than three decades, Calcutta, like Kishore Ganj, never really became his home. Now, as I mentioned earlier, though this journey between Bonogram, Kishore Ganj and Calcutta gives the impression of conforming to the conventional trajectory in which the village or Bonogram represents the home and the city or Kishore Ganj and Calcutta represents the wilderness of exile, this impression is problematized by a more careful reading of Chaudhuri's autobiographical work. And this is a reading that I would now want to present to you. Thus, one of the first things that a more careful reader of autobiography notices, for instance, is that in the sections of the narrative we have just discussed, Chaudhuri presents himself as part of a larger community. Consequently, the emotions that he describes in these sections as being associated with spaces like the ancestral village or the country town or the city are primarily emotions of this larger community which Chaudhuri mimics in order to fit in. Hence, when he is in Kishorganj, Chaudhuri feels obliged to consider his ancestral village as his home and the country town as a place of exile because he is meticulously coached by the adults who surround him to do so. Similarly, when in Calcutta, Chaudhuri feels obliged to carry the badge of his provincial identity because it was considered to be part of one's duty to remain loyal to one's village roots by his fellow students of the masses. Thus, in the section of his autobiography discussed uh, earlier, the association of home and exile with particular spaces is clearly framed as emotions acquired through socialization, through the desire to belong to particular communities. They are emotions that Chaudhuri internalizes while learning how to function from within the values and norms of his particular social milieu. However, Chaudhuri in autobiography also describes a world of private emotions and personal associations which deeply complicate the socially sanctioned ideas of home and exile discussed above. An attempt to explore this private world of emotions and associations finally brings us to the peculiarities of Chaudhuri's anglicized self-fashioning for which he is so widely, widely regarded as anti-Indian. For Chaudhuri, one of the most influential figures that Western education exposed him to was someone called Henry Sumner Main. Main is most well known for his theory of social evolution, in which he argues that, and I quote, the movement of the progressive societies 
has hitherto been a progress from status to contract status to contract so the contract represents the more civilized the more progressive part of human society Mean explains this evolutionary movement from status to contract by proposing that the more primitive forms of society are bound together by kinship laws, kinship status, making the extended family the most essential part of their social unit. The progress towards modernity, on the other hand, is defined as the gradual dissolution of family dependency and the growth of individual obligation in its place which forms the basis of contract. Thus, according to Maine, in the more modern societies, which formed the hallmark of the West, individuals came together voluntarily and were not bound by kinship, but by social contract, for instance, by being citizens of the same state. He then goes on to suggest that while primitive societies like those in India, that's what he argues, not me, have remained largely organized around kinship status. Whereas, and I quote, in Western Europe, the progress achieved in the direction of social evolution has been considerable. So, as far as Maine is concerned, the Maine which Chaudhary read and imbibed, West represents a progressive society because it represents contract. India represents a region, a degenerate society because it represents kinship status as its norm. One major aspect of Chaudhary's anglicized self-fashioning constituted of his internalizing means proposition of the individual as freely agreeing to enter into a social contract over the individual whose social position is determined by his placement within a web of family relations. This led Chaudhary to attach himself with Bonogram, Kishorganj, and Calcutta in ways very different from what he was otherwise socially conditioned to do. For instance, if family ties made it socially imperative that he regard Bonogram as his true home, then it was precisely these family ties that made it difficult for him to be completely at home in Bonogram, where no social interaction was possible outside the kinship group. Thus, the idyllic picture of Chaudhary lazily sprawling in an immense bed in Bonogram, away from the regimentation of urban clock time of Kishore Ganj, is undermined in the autobiography of an unknown Indian by the picture of Bonogram as, and I quote, the empty shell of the past. If Maine's influence made Bonogram unhomely for Chaudhary, the same influence made him regard Kishore Ganj, the place in which he was explicitly taught to be in exile, as the place where he belonged. Chaudhary states in his autobiography that each time he returned to Kishore Ganj after his trips to the village, I quote, we felt as if we had come back to our native element. This was because Kishore Ganj was completely devoid of the despised ties of the extended kinship network. As I have already mentioned, the bond in Kishore Ganj was the bond of being fellow citizens of a shared urban space. Thus, for Chaudhary, the existence in Kishore Ganj was social as distinct from tribal, right? Within the scheme borrowed from Maine, this meant being closer to the ideal of human progress that had been perfected in the West in general and in England in particular. So Kishore Ganj was better than Bonogram in this sense, more modern, more progressive. The same kind of home and exile ambivalence, which problematizes Chaudhary's sense of belonging to both Bonogram and Kishore Ganj, also complicates his stay in Calcutta. As mentioned earlier, the colonial city of Calcutta is described by Chaudhary as the place where he felt the most exiled. Yet, interestingly, it was also the place where he chose to stay the whole of his adolescence and his youth, as well as considerable part of his middle age. He spent more than 30 years in Calcutta, the place where he claims he felt to be the most exiled. Thus, in each of the three places, Bonogram, Kishore Ganj, and Calcutta, the idea of exile and home overlapped so problematically that his journeys between these three places were apparently never journeys of homecoming, but always journeys from one kind of homelessness to another. Hence, whereas a national autobiography begins and ends with the home in India, in Chaudhary's autobiographies, all the spaces in India that he inhabits are equally replete with a sense of exile. 
The desire to return home, which is strongly evoked in each of these spaces, cannot be satisfied by moving into any of them. Interestingly, the journey that Choudhury describes as ultimately connecting, connecting him with a sense of home is his journey to England. And it peculiarly reverses the underlying pattern of exile and homecoming that forms the grammar of the national autobiography. And it is to this reversal that we now turn. Choudhury wrote autobiography quite a few years before he was able to visit England uh, physically. Nevertheless, in its very opening section, there is a whole chapter dedicated to that country, to England. Choudhury explains this inclusion by stating, and I quote, England, evoked by imagination and enjoyed emotionally, has been as great an influence on me as any of the places sensibly experienced. Choudhury recalls how the names of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert were familiar to him from early childhood. Also, English heroism was made incarnate for Choudhury by such Boer War veterans like General Roberts and General Kitchener, who were not merely familiar names, but also known faces from the two panoramic pictures of the Boer War, which hung in one of the huts of their Kishorganj home, Kishorganj house. Another object that evoked a reverential image of England and its civilizational attainments was a collection of English books that was proudly exhibited in a glass-fronted cupboard decorated with china vases, flowers, and various other knickknacks. The volumes in the collected, uh, collection ranged from Charles Annandale's English Dictionary to the works of Shakespeare and Milton. All these familiar names, pictures, and books created the impression in young, in young Chaudhuri of an England which, in spite of its distance, was as ever-present as the sky itself. Interestingly, for Chaudhuri, the visual image that accompanied his conceptualization of England was not urban, but almost wholly rural. And these pastoral images were supplied by English literature. Chaudhary mentions that Mary Mitford's book, Our Village, was one of his favorite reads as a boy. And this popular children's book, uh, which was first published periodically during the 1820s and 1830s, vividly describes the rural life of a village in England and begins with the assertion that of all situations for a constant residence, that which appears to me most delightful is a little village far in the country. Such evocations of the image of a village as home exerted a strong pull on Chaudhuri as a young man and presented, in contrast to his ancestral home at Vonogram, a redemptive vision of rural dwelling. This redemptive pastoral space that was located in the England of imagination was even more powerfully visualized through the aid of another of his favorite childhood books, which was the Pal Paul Graves Children's Treasury. As Chaudhary writes in autobiography, uh, Ariel's song Full Fathom 5 from Shakespeare's The Tempest, coupled with Webster's call for the robin, redbreast, and the wren, and poems like Wordsworth's Lucy, Gray, and Daffodils, these would be familiar to you as students of English literature, set our imagination this stirring. And I'll read out a long quote from Chaudhary, and maybe uh, you as students of literature might be able to connect with him here. What a magic country it was where the drowned were transformed into pearl and coral. Here he's talking about the tempest and where the robin and the wren covered the friendless bodies of unburied men with leaves and flowers and the ant, the field mouse and the mole reared hillocks over them. Reading these lines of Webster, our hearts warmed up with a faith that could be described as the inverse of Rupert Brooks. He was happy in the conviction that if he died in a distant land, some part of that foreign soil would become forever England. We had the feeling that if we died in England, what would become forever England would be a little foreign flesh. And with that faith, there was happiness in perishing in an English glade with the robin and the wren twittering overhead. These lines, packed with literary illusions, can be easily regarded as sheer exhibitionism on the part of an anglicized Indian. Yet, uh, anglicized Indian, sorry. Yet, uh, such a critical judgment does not quite explain why the pastoral image evoked by the British poetry would cast such a spell on a small boy from a small country town in the backwater of the British Empire so as to make him dream of dying in the English glade. 
The reason is, however, explained if this pastoral space is read as an anxiety-free rural haven that is familiar like the ancestral village, yet free from the fear of regressing into a rustic backwardness, which was associated with Bonograph. This pastoral vision is located at the heart of England. Therefore, in Maine's scheme of evolution, it represented the most progressive of human societies. This English countryside of the literature thus became for Chaudhary the village of nostalgia to which it was possible to return without the fear of losing either individuality or affiliation to the ideal of human progress as represented by the West. The juxtaposition of the rural England with the idea of home is further emphasized in Thy Hand Great Anarch, which is a second volume of the autobiography, which was published in the 1980s. In this text, Chaudhary tells of a moment of epiphany when the known landscape of rural East Bengal, the landscape of his home, gets magically transformed into the landscape of the English countryside. However, this time the catalyst is not poetry, but the paintings of John Constable. The moment of epiphany, which, uh, and I don't know whether you uh, know uh, John Constable's paintings or not, so uh, maybe I'll share one of his paintings. He was a famous 19th century British painter, and I'll uh, put one of his paintings on the screen so you will be able to better understand what I'm talking about here. So I'm sure all of you can view a painting, right? So... This is one of the more famous paintings by John's Con John Constable. The, uh, mo uh, however, this time the catalyst is not poetry, as I was telling you, but the paintings of John Constable. The moment of epiphany, which, as Chaudhary states, occurred in 1927 during his very last stay in Kishorganj, apparently proved to be so significant a turning point that he describes it as an experience which I can regard as conversion in the religious sense. These are Chaudhary's words. Chaudhary writes that while strolling at the edge of the town, he suddenly came across a cluster of huts hedged in by bamboo clumps with a pond before it, reflecting the clouds that had taken on the red and pink tint of the setting sun. And now I quote from Chaudhary. The whole scene was like one of the constable's landscapes, and I can confirm the impression after seeing the constable country. It came to me in a flash that the Bengali scene too had a particular beauty of its own, very intimate, but not less moving for that. It was like enlightenment bestowed in a blessed moment. So in this passage too, as in the previously quoted passage referring to Rupert Brooke's poem, there is a juxtaposition. There is a juxtaposition of home and the colonial metropolis as the English pastoral landscape is merged with rural East Bengal. So East Bengal becomes uh, an image of the kind of picture that you are seeing on the screen right now. The moment of enlightenment dissolves the home exile binary as the iconic village homestead, which marks the place for return in the conventional journey of exile and homecoming, is perceived not located in the anxiety-laden space of the ancestral village of Bonogram, but in Constable Country. And once the poles of home and exile are reversed, the journeys too change direction. Hence, for Chaudhary, a journey to England becomes not a journey into the wilderness of exile, but rather a journey of homecoming. Chaudhary visited England for a couple of times in the 1950s and 1960s before permanently moving there in the 1970s. He settled down in Oxford and never returned to India again. But the question here is, did Chaudhary's physical journey to England actually lead him to the redemptive pastoral home of his imagination? Chaudhary's writings on his life in England provide an ambiguous answer. Some scholars have argued that a book like A Passage to England, which Chaudhary wrote just after his first visit to the colonial metropolis, betrays signs of a very deep conflict arising from Chaudhary's inability to perfectly fit the England of his imagination with the post-World War II England, which he physically confronted. Yet what is important to note here is that in his later writings, produced after he had permanently shifted to Oxford, 
Chaudhary never ceases to stress on the fact that his move to England did indeed bring him back to his home. However, the image of home that the reader comes across in these later writings is no more the pastoral England that he had imaginatively constructed while he was in India. The home that he writes about from Oxford is an imagined version of his childhood home in East Bengal. What helps him construct or reconstruct this idea, this new idea of the old home is not books of English poetry, which he first encountered within the charmed glass fronted cupboard of his father in Kishorganj, but rather Bengali books that his mother used to read. So in his last autobiography, Aji Hote Shatobosho Agi, Chaudhary writes of his mining the Bodleian Library uh, in Oxford to retrieve these other books that informed his childhood. And I quote, in my childhood days, my mother used to have a book, Helena Kabbo, written by Anundo Babu, Anundo Chandra Mitra. I have found that book in the library here. This rediscovery of his Indian childhood in the shelves of the Bodleian Library at Oxford is coupled by his rediscovery of Kishore Ganj in the fields of Oxford. In his Bengali essay, Ami Kano Bilete Achi, Chaudhary describes how, during the course of his morning walks in Oxford, he was brought back every day to the remembered landscape of the small country town where he was born, Kishore Ganj. So does this bring him back home in the conventional sense that we find in other national autobiographies, other political autobiographies or not? I don't have an answer to this question, but while uh, you ponder over this question and try and figure out your own answer, uh, your own answers, probably, I will leave you with a quote from Chaudhary's essay, Ami Kano Bilete Achi. And with this, I will end my presentation. In a short distance from my previous house in Oxford, there was a large park. Remarkably enough, there began a cornfield from the edges of this park. I used to get out of the park and take to the footpaths within the cornfields, walking down for three or four miles. At the end of the road, there was Sherwell River. And climbing a bridge on top of it, I could see, just like in Kishorganj, a river with clusters of reeds along its banks and ducks floating along. Thank you. For that uh, lucid talk, we do have a few uh, questions over here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess that's as well flashed on the screen. So this is a question from uh, read, Sixth uh -huh. Semester by Shampurna Choudhury. And she says, uh, Respected sir, Nero Choudhury regarded the three places where he lived not as his home. Is it because, because he harked for a past or an utopic place? Um, yes. uh, uh, Rampurna, uh, there, I, I guess there is no easier answer to this question. As I mentioned in my paper that uh, his belongingness to all of these three places were complicated because of a varied reason. Uh, because of how he was socialized, because of the kind of Western education to which he was exposed, because of his reading of Maine and of his imbibing of certain colonial ideology. Um, so all of that created a very problematic sense of being at home and being at exile uh, with regard to all of these three places, right? So uh, was any of these places utopic? Well, all of these three places were at the same time utopic and also problematically uh, spaces of exile. Thank you. Uh, this is actually a question in retrospect to Shampuna's question. And uh, this is what I would like to inquire. Um, since um, it seems that Niro Choudhury had constructed his notion of home uh, from the images that he had uh, come across as a child in Bonogram. Is it more uh, of a sort of imaginary space rather than, or textual rather than 
uh, you know, a real physical space. Uh, which home. space are we talking about? Home. Yeah, the space of home. That, so, that uh, uh, well. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, what was home for uh, Niro Chodhi, right? Uh, probably the last passage that I read out, uh, if you try and unpack that passage, uh, you would arrive at an answer. But the answer would be very complicated in the sense that the idea of home that is presented in that passage is a conglomeration of the images that he physically uh, experienced while uh, living in Kishore Ganj. Uh, but Kishore Ganj, though he talks about Kishore Ganj, it is also a space which is not uh, regulated by the regimented clock time. It is a place of home, is a place of leisure, of, of relaxation, etc., etc. So that is also there. The monogram, shadow of monogram is there. The shadow of Kishore Ganj is there. England is there, right? And uh, uh, he was experiencing uh, this home while being physically located in England, but at the back of his mind, what was also operating were all of those textual kind of cues that he had accumulated from his very childhood, the idea of England as the idyllic pastoral space. So um, whether it was this or that uh, would be uh, too much of a simplistic assessment of this very complex image. Thank you. I believe that is all we have as far as questions are concerned. We have a few comments, but that's all for the question. So we would now move on to the vote of thanks that will be delivered by, by our head of the department, Rajkumar Bormun. So I would invite him to deliver the same. Okay. Durva, am I audible? Yes, you are. So uh, I feel privileged to have been asked for the vote of thank. thanks on behalf of the Department of English. Uh, I first thank Professor Shayan Chattopadhyay for such an illuminating lecture on the tradition of uh, political autobiography in Indian literature that dealt with how political autobiography operates and also how they became national autobiography at the same time. Uh, uh, also, uh, how uh, Niyorsi Choudhury, uh, Choudhury's narrative changes the trajectory of national autobiography by trying to preserve his anglicized self. Uh, uh, secondly, I want to thank our principal ma'am, Dr. Orthoshi Karfa, for the necessary permission to organize this program. At the same time, I'll also, I also thank all, all my departmental colleagues for the, for the kind of support which was and which are needed for this program. Uh, I once again thank uh, Professor Chattopadhyay. Thank you so much, sir, for uh, thank you. Thank for you. Uh, coming in and delivering your lecture. I believe then we might 